Well, this is my last video. It all has to come to this. Friday night in the college town of Isla Vista. <laughs> Streets typically filled with students. For multiple gunshot victims in front of the Ivy Deli. Okay, we need a second ambulance for another gunshot wound at 6553 Cardo, Ivy Deli, Mark, code 3. Friday night, another, another gunshot for chest. So this 22-year-old man called it his day of retribution. If its students dead, the University of California Santa Barbara community is in mourning. The gunman who methodically planned the attack chronicled his descent into a deranged rage. Tomorrow is the day of retribution. Is this the latest face of evil in America? So this week on Red Room Revisits, we are revisiting my two-part special on incels and the subculture that is the incel community. This episode originally aired in September 2021, and since then, I've seen the conversation around incels evolve online and become way more mainstream than it was back then. Today, we're going to focus on Elliot Roger, or as he's known in the community, the Supreme gentleman whose hatred and obsession led to the brutal murder of six innocent people in 2014. Before we get going, whether you're watching on YouTube or if you're watching on Spotify or just listening, be sure to follow or subscribe and leave me five-star reviews. It really does help the podcast reach more people and it's a great way to help the channel or the podcast out and I'd very much appreciate it. So if you've been present whatsoever in the online discourse over the last 12 months, you've probably already heard or even thrown around the term incel. In 2023, the term is typically referred to a chronically online woman-hating man who needs to get out a little bit more and probably like touch a little bit of grass, but it conjures up a very specific image in our minds. A greasy-fingered keyboard warrior who lurks in the darkest corners of the internet blaming women for everything that goes wrong in their lives. The rise of internet personalities like Andrew Tate has popularized the term, with many people describing his legions of fans as incels, despite his entire thesis being the complete opposite. But the term incel first appeared all the way back in 1993. A Canadian graduate student named Alana Baltwood set up a web page called Alana's Involuntarily Celibate Project. She posted a list of possible definitions for incel, not limited to gender, sexuality or sexual preference or even marital status. The most straightforward of which was the state of being sexually inactive whilst wishing to be otherwise. Over the course of the last 30 years, the term has been appropriated by a specific group of men online a group who class themselves as being involuntarily celibate. Incels believe that feminism, modern Western culture, women's liberation and the now obsessive use of social media have led to their unlucky fate, that women no longer seek out partners based on an array of qualities like stability or morals or values, but mostly on physical attributes resulting in men having to reach a bar that is impossible for them to reach as man. This is known as female hypergamy, a theory that women only marry up, leaving 80% of women seeking the top 20% of men. And this, of course, in the eyes of the incel, leaves the bottom 80% of men in an involuntarily celibate state and an angry and bitter state as well. There is so much more to the psychology and pathology of incels, and we don't have time to go into that today. Instead, we're going to take a look at a specific case of a very specific incel called Elliot Roger, who personifies the most extreme end of this ideology and whose violent and horrendous actions are seen as some incels as heroic and some as the inevitable solution to modern society. Humanity. All of my suffering on this world has been at the hands of humanity, particularly women. It has made me realize just how brutal and twisted humanity is as a species. All I ever wanted was to fit in and live a happy life amongst humanity, but I was cast out and rejected, forced to endure an existence of loneliness and insignificance, 
all because the females of the human species were incapable of seeing the value in me. This is the story of how I, Elliot Roger, came to be. This is the story of my entire life. It is a dark story of sadness, anger, and hatred. It is a story of a war against cruel injustice. These are the words of Elliot Roger, a self-identified incel who committed the 2014 Isla Vista killings. These were a series of deadly and misogynistic terror attacks in Isla Vista, California, that resulted in the brutal murder of six innocent people and the injury of 14 others by gunshot, stabbing, and vehicle ramming all near the campus of the University of California, Santa Barbara. After the murders, Elliot Roger turned the gun on himself, martyring himself on what he called the Day of Retribution. But this massacre is not all he left behind. Before he left the world, Elliot wrote a 140-page manifesto called My Twisted World, The Story of Elliot Roger. The opening passage is what you just heard, and it gives a glimpse into the mind of this person. Elliot was born in the UK in 1991 to an English father and a Malaysian mother, but he eventually moved to California. He's from a middle-class family. His father was a pretty well-established movie maker and producer, and he was actually the second unit director on The Hunger Games, so they were pretty well off. He grew up well, he traveled the world, and he lived to be honest, a very, very privileged life. He was a child of divorce with his parents divorcing when he was a little bit older. And like many, he does note that this divorce affected him very negatively. The The breakup of his family was a cornerstone in his childhood. He was diagnosed as having pervasive developmental disorder, not otherwise specified. And there are various accounts of him online alleging that he was also diagnosed as having autism spectrum disorder. Any of these disorders, of course, are absolutely not a signifier of becoming this kind of person. I just want to make that very clear. But it is important to understand some aspects of his psyche of how he looked at the world and some of the struggles that he encountered as a young adult. For example, it could explain some of the many struggles that Elliot had when it came to making friends and communicating effectively with his peers. He wrote a lot about feeling left out as a child and feeling different to everyone despite trying desperately to make friends. I thought all of the cool kids were obnoxious jerks, but I tried as best as I could to hide my disgust and appear cool to them. They were obnoxious jerks, and yet somehow it was these boys who all of the girls flocked to. This showed me that the world was a brutal place, and human beings were nothing more than savage animals. But the polite, kind gentleman doesn't win in the real world. The girls don't flock to the gentleman. They flock to the alpha male. They flock to the boys who appear to have the most power and status. And it was a ruthless struggle to reach such a height. Elliot also writes a lot in his manifesto about his frustrations of being mixed race and how he felt it hindered his opportunities of being popular and successful. He had very specific views on the superiority of not just white people, but white women, and often conflated whiteness as being a signifier of being cool or being popular or accepted. When I became aware of this common social structure at my school, I also started to examine myself and compare myself to these cool kids. I realized, with some horror, that I wasn't cool at all. I had a dorky hairstyle, I wore plain and uncool clothing, and I was shy and unpopular. I was always described as the shy boy in the past, but I never really thought my shyness would affect me in a negative way, until this point. This revelation about the world, and about myself, really decreased my self-esteem. On top of this was the feeling that I was different because I am of mixed race. I am half white, half Asian, and this made me different from the normal fully white kids that I was trying to fit in with. So throughout school, uh, from primary right all the way through to secondary school education, it's clear that Elliot was an outcast. 
He was growing increasingly frustrated with his lack of social status. And, you know, he does at one point get really big into World of Warcraft, where he kind of gets a little bit of a community feeling. Um, he makes some online friends. He's playing this most of the time online. But at one point, he even finds out that the group of friends that he has online, that he games with, actually meet up without him in person to play. And this just kind of crumbled his world even more because the one group of people who he did connect with and did have some form of rapport with also were leaving him out to an extent. His manifesto also details some of his earliest crushes um, with girls and interactions with women, like this one when he was only five years old. I was a five-year-old boy playing with a girl my own age like any normal boy would do. I was enjoying life in a world that I loved. I was happy and completely oblivious of the fact that my future on this world would only turn to darkness and misery because of girls. This girl who was my friend, Maddie Humphreys, would eventually come to represent everything I hate and despise, everything that is against me, and everything that I'm against. I was playing innocently with this girl, in the manner that all children play. We even took baths together, it was the only time in my life that I would see a girl my age naked. When I think about the experiences I had during my friendship with her, it makes me think ominously of the fact that all children, boys and girls, start out the same. We all start out innocent, and we all start out together. Only through the experiences and circumstances of growing up do we drift apart, form allegiances, and face each other as enemies. That is when wars happen, and that is when the true nature of humanity rises to the surface. At this stage of my life, of course, my war hadn't started yet, and it wouldn't start for a long time. I was enjoying my life without a care in the world, not knowing that all of my joy is destined to turn to dust. Elliot struggles throughout high school with his relationship with women. He talks a lot about different crushes he has and he's clearly gaining more momentum in hatred towards women. He really sees the, that any woman's lack of interest in him as not only a fault on himself, but a fault to them. He also sees a lot of the boys in his high school who managed to have very successful relationships with women, both platonically and romantically, as taking away from his chance to, you know, engage in romantic relationships. He really does project this insecurity onto other people and it comes out in quite intense hatred. So when Elliot gets to college age and he does go to college, he does feel like this could be a new chance for him to make friends and get female attention um, that he feels not only that he wants, but he feels genuinely entitled to this attention. He writes about an experience that enrages him when that happens him through college. And this is when he meets two of his white roommates' friend, Chance. Now, Chance is black. And to Elliot's dis gust he lost his virginity to a white girl despite being black now obviously you know to any other person this would not be a thing but Elliot's deep inner racism and his own strange conflation of whiteness to superiority it just bends his mind here is a clip from his manifesto detailing this I felt so inferior as it reminded me of how much I have missed out in life and then this black boy named Chance said that he lost his virginity when he was only 13. In addition, he said that the girl he lost his virginity to was a blonde white girl. I was so enraged that I almost splashed him with my orange juice. I indignantly told him that I did not believe him, and then I went to my room to cry. I cried and cried and cried, and then I called my mother and cried to her on the phone. So Elliot's racism, misogyny, his self-hatred is all beginning to escalate in the run-up to his 2014 massacre, which is all catalogued in his manifesto and some of the clips you've obviously heard today. College is not the fresh start that he wished for, okay? And that's putting it lightly. He is still struggling to get any female attention. Despite investing in things like designer clothes, uh, he talks a lot about these Gucci sunglasses that he gets. He puts a lot of 
emphasis and priority on material objects. I'm not sure from reading about him if this is because of his privileged upbringing. Throughout his manifesto, he puts a huge stress on the importance of wealth and money, um, talking about you know how much he has traveled, how many nice restaurants he's been to as a child, how he loves how um, celebrity adjacent his father is. He talks a lot about going to the Hunger Games premiere, even when his mom and dad break up he talks a lot about how when his dad got a new girlfriend it was because of his money and when his mother got a new boyfriend he only really speaks highly of him because he's a rich guy so he definitely has a lot of internalized um, opinions on wealth and that conflating to status but as I said he invests in what he thinks are designer cool clothes and it doesn't work so he's kind of at a loss I have a nice car a BMW Well, it's nicer than 90% of the people in my college. Um, you know, I'm polite. I'm the ultimate gentleman. And yet, you girls, you never give me a chance. You know, I, I, I put a lot of effort into dressing nice. These, these sunglasses here they were $300. Giorgio Armani. So I'll put them on. He starts to go to a salon to get his hair done. He starts to, you know, try and pay more attention to his looks. And it should be said, Elliot Roger was a conventionally attractive guy. His own insecurities were definitely, you know, I don't know, just these intense self-hating moments, not based really on any reality. So none of the girls in his college classes were seeming to pay him any attention. They all seemed to date these jockish types, which Elliot hated he talked a lot about how much he hates these shaved buzz cut head jock guys um and he sees them pretty much as his mortal enemy he talks of a day where he and his dad go to starbucks uh for some coffee but he gets enraged when he sees what he describes as a dark-skinned mexican guy who's dating a hot white blonde girl The couple sit down across from him and his dad and he said, when I saw the two of them kissing, I could barely contain my rage. I stood up in anger and I was about to walk up to them and pour my glass of soda all over their heads. And he says he actually would have done this if his dad wasn't there, but he says that it would have, you know, embarrassed his father too much, who he thinks is already embarrassed because he doesn't have a girlfriend. I mean, like what dad goes into a Starbucks and sees a couple and thinks, why isn't my son with a girl, you know? It, it, these are all internalized self-hating thoughts really so he actually goes back to the starbucks a few days later because it's his local starbucks and when he gets his coffee he sees another young couple and he says a few moments later when i looked up for my drink i saw a young couple standing in line the two of them were kissing passionately the boy looked like an obnoxious punk he was tall and wore baggy jeans The girl was a pretty blonde. They looked like they were in the throes of passionate sexual attraction with each other, rubbing their bodies together and tongue kissing in front of everyone. I was absolutely livid and envious with hatred. When they left the store, I followed them to their car and I splashed my coffee all over them. The boy yelled at me and I quickly ran away in fear. I was panicking as I got into my car and I drove off, shaking with rage fueled excitement. So here he's talking about how he not only, you know, hates these women who are denying him of his right of sexual activity, but also the men that they are dating and sleeping with. And here is also where we're starting to see his violent actions come out. Like, make no mistake, this is assault. He's throwing hot coffee on innocent couples who are enjoying a day out in Starbucks. Like, these are, you know, red flags showing that he is getting, you know, ag aggressive and violent and starting to act on his own inner dialogue, his inner hateful dialogue. I hated all of those obnoxious, boisterous men who were able to enjoy pleasurable sex lives with beautiful girls. But I hated the girls even more, because they were the ones who chose those men instead of me. It was their choice. They are the ones who deprived me of love and sex. But Elliot doesn't stop here. He also goes on to say he wants to feel vindicated by killing all young couples enjoying life together. It's clear that he's having severe, violent fantasies. I wanted to do horrible things to that couple. 
I wanted to inflict pain on all young couples. It was around this point in my life that I realized I was capable of doing such things. I would happily do such things. I was capable of killing them, and I wanted to. I wanted to kill them slowly, to strip the skins off their flesh. They deserve it. The males deserve it for taking the females away from me, and the females deserve it for choosing those males instead of me. As I said, like, this is red flag central. Not only is his anger and resentment bubbling up within him, but he's actually physically assaulting people. He remarks about the rage-fueled excitement as if it's like, it's it's ticked off something in his head. He's realizing that he's he's feeling vindicated when he physically attacks these people. Now, Elliot at the time was active on some incel chat rooms and allegedly he would send some of these to his parents, showing them, you know, trying to tell them why he felt the way he felt. But his parents didn't really pay much attention to them. They kind of just put it off as like teenage rage or teenage angst. And, you know, they've said on a few occasions, like they never even really opened the links until it was too late. He speaks at length in his manifesto about being a disappointment to his father, as I said, about not having a girlfriend, despite being what he describes as the perfect gentleman. He talks about how his father, you know, made sure to bring him to all these fancy restaurants and, you know, travel the world with him, yet he still couldn't get a girl. And he is just presuming that this enraged his father. So he claims that through the year 2013, he is desperately trying to connect with women. He kind of says that this was, you know, the year that he put it all on the line. He goes to bars to try and meet them. He asks his mother for a new BMW to impress them with because he becomes obsessed with the car hierarchy, as he puts it, within college. And I'm sure there is some level of that, but, you know, again, much to his disappointment, it doesn't make girls interested in him. He even connects with an old childhood friend at like a family friend party who he knew when he was younger and this guy apparently had a lot of luck with the ladies when he got older and he asked them for advice but again it doesn't seem to work. When none of this worked he said it absolutely enraged him and he decided that 2014 would be his final year alive. This would be the year that he would act out what he called the day of retribution. At first he decided it would happen in April but he said he always kept hope that you know in the run-up to this month he would find a girlfriend and he could call it all off you know but Again, it didn't happen. You know, he says he he even enrolled in school. He even enrolled in classes. He started smiling at girls on campus, but none of them seemed interested in him. He writes in his manifesto about his plan for the day. So he says that he would have to kill his roommates first, going into gruesome, gruesome detail that I'm not going to go into here on how he would do so. And this, he claims, will symbolize his hatred for all men. For the men who, as he puts it, took away his chance to engage in sexual relations and romantic relationships with women. He says he'll then symbolically kill all members of a nearby sorority house, who he claims, again, is symbolic for all the pretty and popular girls that refused to give him any attention and refused, you know, historically to ever give him any attention. He then goes on to say how he's going to plan on killing his stepbrother and stepmother, robbing their SUV and using it to run over as many people as possible, shooting the rest. He also talks about how he's planning on doing this on a weekend where his dad is out of town on a business trip. And I found it absolutely chilling because I thought at first he was saying this in a way of like okay well at least I won't have to kill my dad but then he goes on to say it will just be easier if I don't have to get past him so again no one is standing in the way apparently on Elliot Rogers sick fucking twisted reality. So Elliot was also an avid YouTube user. Now there are a lot of incels on YouTube, less so these days, but in 2014 it was kind of popping off on YouTube for the incels and he would upload stream of consciousness videos to his channel dealing with his frustrations with dating and the world at large. Hey, Elliot Roger here. I'm up in the hills in Montecito right now. It's truly a beautiful day, but as I've always said, a beautiful environment is the darkest hell if you have to experience it all alone. And sadly, I've been alone for a very long time. In April 2014, 
running up to the day of retribution, as he called it, he uploaded one video called Why Do Girls Hate Me So Much? And this actually resulted in Elliot receiving a wellness check from the police that was instigated by his mother after seeing the video was uploaded. I'm 22 years old and I've never had a girlfriend. I'm still a virgin. I mean, this world is so beautiful, but it's so sad and depressing when I have to experience it all alone. I don't know why you girls hate me so much. This is the only way I can ask you. Elliot describes in his manifesto that on the actual day of retribution, which was April 26th, I believe, he fell sick and he said... I, I realized I, I couldn't act this out when I was having it, when I had a head cold. So he postponed it for a month. Now, unfortunately, this story, as we know from the start of the show, doesn't have a happy ending. He did go through with his horrific and gruesome plan. On May 23rd, 2014, at 7.38 in the evening, Elliot purchased a triple vanilla latte at the Isla Vista Starbucks. Earlier on that day, Elliot brutally stabbed his two roommates, Chen Wan Hong and George Chen, and their friend, David Wang, who just happened to be calling by. He was unfortunately collateral damage in Elliot's day of retribution. At 9.17 p.m., Roger uploaded his final YouTube video, Elliot Rogers' Retribution. He then sent his 140-page manifesto to his family members, his mother, his father, even his stepbrother, his therapist, former school teachers, and childhood friends. Tomorrow is the day of retribution. The day in which I will have my revenge against humanity, against all of you. For the last eight years of my life, ever since I've hit puberty, I've been forced to endure an existence of loneliness, rejection, and unfulfilled desires. All because girls have never been attracted to me. But in those years, I've had to rot in loneliness. You girls have never been attracted to me. I don't know why you girls aren't attracted to me, but I will punish you all for it. I don't know what you don't see in me. I'm the perfect guy. And yet you throw yourselves at all these obnoxious men instead of me, the supreme gentleman. On the day of retribution, I am going to enter the hottest sorority house of UCSB. And I will slaughter every single spoiled, stuck-up, blonde slut I see inside there. <laughs> yes. After I've annihilated every single girl in the sorority house, I'll take to the streets of Isla Vista and slay every single person I see there. All those popular kids who live such lives of hedonistic pleasure while I've had to rot in loneliness for all these years. You will all be animals. You are animals, and I will slaughter you like animals. I'll be a god exacting my retribution on all those who deserve it and you do deserve it just for the crime of living a better life than me he then went to the alpha phi sorority house with the intention of killing everybody there he rang the doorbell there was no answer and he shot through the door. Here is where he shot and killed Catherine Cooper and Veronica Weiss. He then drove into town and fired into a deli from inside his BMW, killing Christopher Michaels Martinez. The first images of the terrifying moments in this college town with a gunman on a rampage. Students seen ducking for cover in this surveillance video from the IV Deli Mart as bullets rip through the store's windows. He fired two shots in. It stopped for about two seconds before they just started raining through. Some of those shots killing 20-year-old Chris Michaels Martinez. Investigators say the deli was one of 10 places Friday night right next to the UC Santa Barbara campus where 22-year-old Elliot Roger hurt or killed people during his mad drive around town, hitting students like Nick Pasichuk, who tonight is still recovering. Shots fired, shots fired. 
fire. The first calls for help just before 9.30 p.m., but we now know it may have been many hours before that when police say Roger killed three men inside his own apartment, all stabbed repeatedly. Survivors say the suspect was smiling as he shot at them. Deputies chasing after him in his black BMW exchanged gunfire with him twice. The rampage ended with a crash. It would appear. Roger continued his rampage, shooting at several pedestrians in a drive-by shooting and striking others with his car. He wounded 12 people in this phase of the rampage, six by gunshot and six with his vehicle. He was pursued by police, got into a gunfight with a sheriff, tried to run away and ended up shooting himself in the head. Elliot Rogers was 22 years old. This world so twisted it's so cruel and you girls make it cruel you girls have starved me of sex and enjoyment and pleasure for my entire youth you've taken eight years away from my life eight years I'll never get back do you know how much misery you've caused me I'm such a nice guy. Why won't you give me a chance? Ellie Roger has a convoluted reputation within the incel community. Some view him as what they call a fake cell, which basically means that he's a fake incel because incels, a vast majority of them, do believe that you have to be conventionally unattractive or ugly to be an incel. And, you know, from pictures of Elliot Roger, we can see he was conventionally attractive. He was a handsome young man by all guards, all standards, really. Some, however, view him as a martyr for the incel community. And they often threaten to go ER, as they like to call it, which, you know, again, means that they are going to maybe act on their own day of retribution. There's even some talk on incel communities as having what they call a beta revolution, which is what they kind of envision to be a worldwide day of retribution, where incels kind of take over the world and act out huge acts of violence against the general population. Now, the incel community is known as a shitposting community by all regards. Again, I go into a huge detail on this on my episode over on Patreon, but, you know, shitposting and intense irony and self-deprecating humor are cornerstones of the incel communication. So it's hard to know how serious they are when they are kind of talking about these violence acts that they plan on uh, acting on. But as we can see, it doesn't really matter if they are shitposting because there could be one who takes this seriously and actually acts out on it. And in fact, we've had multiple copycat accounts from people within the incel community. For example, the 2015 community college shooting by Christopher Sean Harper Mercer killed nine people. And he wrote a lot online about studying Elliot Rogers' manifesto. There was the 2017 car ramming, which we all remember after the Charlottesville march by James Alex Fields, who was not only an incel, but a neo-Nazi. And that resulted in the death of one woman and injuring, really badly injuring 35 others. Very recently in 2021, Ohio police managed to catch a copycat killer, thankfully, before he was actually able to act on his violent urges. His name was Trace Genko and he was 21. He was identified, self-identified as an incel and was active on many incel communities online. In one post that he made, he allegedly detailed how he sprayed some foids and couples. Now, foids is incel lingo if you don't know if you haven't listened to my episode they have a thesaurus of lingo and how they refer and slang but foids is slang for females so he said he sprayed females and couples with orange juice and a water gun okay sounds kind of innocent right doesn't sound that serious but remember Elliot Rogers also began with not only fantasizing about killing people, but actually assaulting them by throwing coffee on them and wanting to throw his drinks on people when he saw them in, in uh, public. But this guy gets more serious, guys, okay? So according to the charging document, Genko compared his extremely empowering action to Elliot Rogers' actions. 
He wrote a manifesto and he stated in it he would slaughter women out of hatred, jealousy and revenge. And he referred to death as the great equalizer. As part of the investigation that was taken out on him by police, law enforcement agents discovered a note of his that indicated he hoped to aim big and aiming for a number of almost 3,000 victims, saying that he was intending on going to military training to get prepared for his day of retribution. The researches on Genko's electronics that revealed that the day he wrote his manifesto, he searched online for sororities at the University of Ohio. So it was looking to be pretty much a copycat of Elliot Rogers. And thankfully, he was stopped before he could act out on this. In closing, look, Elliot Rogers was clearly a very sick and unhappy individual, to put it lightly. He had clearly a misunderstanding and a mismanagement of his mental health struggles and his various diagnoses. It's hard to say what makes a person like Elliot though. And of course, the vast majority of people who struggle with some of the things that Elliot struggled or struggle with similar diagnoses don't come close to how Elliot turned out. His manifesto does indicate examples of extreme narcissism, something which may be inflated for hyperbole or dramatic effect. But many psychiatrists who have studied his manifesto do believe that he could have suffered from various cluster B type personality disorders. And also possibly some undiagnosed behavioral disorders. His words clearly lacked remorse completely and he showed no empathy for the innocent people that he killed. His words are riddled with delusions of grandeur and show us a person who, although was afforded so much privilege in life and so much opportunity, he instead chose to indulge in the dark parts of the human mind. He decided to lean more into self-pity rather than self-improvement. He blamed his problems on other people. And I think what's really scary is he found an echo chamber of people online that gave him the confirmation bias that he so desperately sought out. This ended up in him projecting his self-hatred, his insecurities and his loneliness onto the innocent people that he killed. Guys, this has been our first episode of the public season of Red Room. Let me know in the comments below what you thought of this episode. Let me know if you've ever heard of Elliot Roger before. And on Spotify, take a look at the episode description down below. There will be some polls and a place for you to let me know what you thought of the episode. I hope you all enjoyed it. And I'll be back next week for another episode. Bye.